Hi, I'm Andy Acton. And I'm Chris Strevens. This is Dentology, the Business of Dentistry podcast. One thing we haven't done for a little while is actually thank our listeners. Because no, they're the people. Actually. They're the people yeah. that, that really kind of give us the um, the energy and the impetus to keep doing this. Yeah, because they keep listening. They do. In fact, more people yes. keep listening, which is which is I think brilliant. The fact of obviously we've managed to keep it interesting and uh, people continue to listen and recommend people to yeah. listen. It must be that's it. And we're so it. fortunate. Our, our guest list. You were saying this before we started recording. How fortunate we are that um, the people that keep you know we approach or want to come on. Mm. Um, the quality of people in dentistry generally is so high, isn't it? Yeah, a bit like, um, I don't know, for some of the older listeners, I feel we're a bit like the Parkinson of the <laughs> of, of the chat show that people quite like being on because we're sort of just good yeah. and we like chatting to people and they can relax. Yeah, and then in, in this episode, we then get the absolute energy the you know the switch is fully on with yeah, yeah. judy dale from boutique yeah what an amazing lady <laughs> she's a great funny i just laugh because i think to myself she is sort of uh almost like constantly on yeah. you know does she have a is there an off switch and when she mm. goes is, like when she goes to sleep she goes well poof, her brain just like cuts out and then yeah. she's up again with it she's think, a lovely i think there's two lady. elements in there that i think people are going to really enjoy there's that thing about the decision making around leaving clinical dentistry mm. uh, obviously was a dentist but but now still working in dentistry not clinical and how do you go through that and how do you kind of assess and analyze what transferable skills you have mm. but also the importance of fun yeah definitely if the one that got me is that if 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 you meet julie and i would strongly suggest you do because she you know, one, it's a good product, but also she's a really nice lady. You can see that confidence that when she was talking about the drama and, and the performing, you know, you can feel yeah. it from it. It's almost yeah. exudes. Yes. That's probably the word I'm thinking yeah. of. Yeah, it's, yeah, no, fabulous episode. It's brilliant. Really, really, really good. good. Really good. I can't believe now we're 140 plus and seven o'clock every Monday morning. We do the same thing. We do. And I tell you what, we have not run out of interesting people to talk to, which is fascinating, isn't it? You know, there's, it's a relatively small market dentistry. I think that serves, the, the, I think that reflects well on dentistry, the fact that there are such a broad range of, of interesting people but also dentistry is beyond dentists isn't it like yeah it's true that is true yeah, yeah when yeah. we it's think not just about dentistry, dentistry yeah. we talk about dentists but there's this whole kind of back end of support system yeah. and businesses that, that support the dentist we're so lucky we have never had a duffer no uh, and, and we can assure you uh, listeners that we haven't had one that we've never shown no nope, they've all, shown. They've, all <laughs> shown. they've all been good they've all been good I, I, I imagine at this point our guest is sitting there thinking, thinking uh -oh. i hope i'm not the first yeah but no, very, we have high hopes for very, this one no pressure doubt, don't we? very very much doubt that so ladies and gentlemen today uh, we are very fortunate um we have judy dale joining us dr judy dale well, and judy's a dentist judy, global sales manager at boutique whitening and wife and mum to felicity and alexander and i only mentioned them because at the moment they're quite young and in years to come they're going to listen back and go oh that's my mum yeah. which is really Aww. exciting so if we name them they get a name check which is yeah, cute how are you doing on, yeah. julie i'm really good thank you um how are you doing andy and chris we're, we're very good we're thank good. you very much yeah. looking forward to this uh, don't be dull yeah this is this is one of the the highlights of for us recording the podcast yeah. is, is so much fun so much fun and it, it from a selfish point of view it's almost like market research we kind of get a real sense of like where dentists is mm -hmm. at, you know, yep. some of the key people in dentistry. So when we have our conversations in the other work we do, we feel really connected to the profession. So, yeah, it's a good day for we us. We love doing this, you know, love yeah. what you do. We love the chatting, chatting, finding out what's going on and, and right, basically uh, just letting you talk. We just sit here and listen. It's, it's really good. I listen to it in the car all the time. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. It's past many, oh. many hours of travelling for me. So thank you. <laughs> and you while away the hours oh, listening to at the some podcast. Point you'll be able to listen to yourself in yeah, the car. Yeah. <laughs> your, your dental career is very wide and varied, and, and, and we'll get to that. But for one so young. Yes. Do you see what I did there? Oh, very nicely it's done. <laughs> very nicely done. But, oh, Chris. But, <laughs> People are always so interesting. It's always fascinating to kind of roll back to the early years and kind of understand, you know, where you got brought up, what your parents are like. Is there history in dentistry? You know, what are those early years like for you? Um, well, I'm from a little town in the northwest of England called St. Helens. Um, St. Helens. Oh. Yeah, uh, yeah, rugby, uh, famous rugby. Uh, rugby. Uh, rugby, isn't that rugby or something? Way, isn't it? Not so well, yeah, around there, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, just a pretty standard upbringing. Um, was brought up um, with my 
younger brother who's now in musical theatre. He's on the West End. West End. He's a performer. So he took Is a he cool? career path. Yeah, he's. What's, in, he, what's he performing in? Um, I don't know if it's been announced, the new thing that he's been... He's just finished oh. in We Will Rock You on the West End and he is in the cast of a very big musical that's just that's been on the West End for a very long time. So, yes. Um, oh, wow. He's doing very well. That's yeah, very he's doing profile. really well. Um, I, I taught him everything he knows all the time that I choreographed him in those step songs. Um, wow. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. All his success comes down to me. Not a tragedy. Uh, yeah. Was that steps? Yeah, that was steps, yeah. yeah. Thank you. And um, yeah, we had we had a great upbringing. Um, not sort of um, that sort of. We didn't have lots of stuff. We brought up in a very small house. Can I just wind back a bit? So he's very theatrical. Are you sort of? Were you? Because you're very front foot, from what I know. So just going back to, were you sort of like a theatrical type? Yes. Youngster. Yeah, I have kind of done quite a bit of drama stuff in my youth. And right. um, I'm really glad that I did, actually, because I never knew all those years ago that it would lead to me being able to present in front of hundreds mm. of people. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Having that confidence. So you just don't know where these skills are going to take you. Um, so, yeah, it was, it, it's definitely benefited me being able to kind of have that, that background. And also, since then, my brother has actually given me sort of speaker training um, when I've kind of had really important things oh, to do. brilliant this by you how should i do this and he's actually logged into a zoom call and talked taught me through how to present myself so oh, cool. yeah it's, it's great to have like friends in high places to, to help you with these sort of things but yeah so but as my, my childhood was was great it was fun um like i said we didn't have too much and also there wasn't a lot of a lot of pressure from my parents to perform academically there was none of that like you know mm. my dad was in the police and my mum was a secretary and no a levels or o levels between them so um wow. kind of Go, going into to school and things there was definitely no expectation to, to go into dentistry um mm. like i fell in with a really good group of friends who are still my best friends now in high school who were really high achievers and i sort of coasted along with them and then they were dragged doctors. along almost yeah, yeah yeah doctors and dentists as well and then that's the that's the direction that i went in yeah cool so why dentistry Oh, as opposed um, to theatre did you think about going into you know drama I, I, or I'm stuff not, like I'm that not, I've not got the talent that my brother's got unfortunately okay. <laughs> did you hear me on the karaoke at the party at the weekend it was <laughs> I thought, I, actually I'll tell you what I, I mean we will talk about this later on but when you started singing there were a couple of people who turned around and went oh can I sing <laughs> It was almost like a bit of a shock, really. But anyway, that, so uh, there anyway, we go. No, I've not really got the talent there. Um, so I went into dentistry because, yeah, I just got, you know, all those kind of A's and A-levels and didn't have a clue what to do, to be honest. And then everybody else was doing dentistry and medicine. And I looked at it and thought, well, I won't need to work weekends or um, evenings <laughs> and overnights if I go into dentistry. Yeah, um, okay, it seemed a little bit more flexible. So um, probably that, that might be the wrong reason <laughs> um, to have gone into it, but absolutely loved dental school, actually, and um, had, had the best time ever. It brings together so many different things that I love, you know, the, the science behind it, um, the art of dentistry, mm. you know, that sort of artistic side, and then having to be a great communicator mm. with your patients. Um, yeah, I absolutely... I, I, I did love it. You're, you you kind of got your head turned through some work experience, didn't you? Which kind of yeah. exposed you to a little bit of dentistry. I, I love when I hear um, people saying it was work experience that, that got me involved. Mm, it's quite a few, actually, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, over the years we have. And, and I do wonder, and, and, and I don't know the answer to this, but I wonder whether it's still something that's quite strong in schools, whether they still have these work experience programs to give young people mm. insights because That's true. particularly as a dentist, you, may, you need to make some, some decisions quite early on in your life in terms of choosing the right A-levels and then you obviously need to go to dental school to qualify. And, and they're quite big decisions for teenagers to make. But if you do work experience, it really gives you a, an idea as to whether it's the sort of thing you want to do or not. It can have a bearing. I don't know whether that's something that, mm. that is still that's as true, present actually, yeah. today as it was perhaps you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. There's more red tape around these things now with like insurance. Yeah. And I, mm. I remember as somebody came into my practice and asked to do work experience. And I think we did have to turn them away because there was certain things, you know, that, you know, I remember when I did it, which would have been a very long time ago now, 
um, probably in 1999 <laughs> or something. Um, it was, you know, I was processing the x-rays and actually helping out, like sort of aspirating and things for the patient. Nowadays, there's no way you'd be able to mm. like, have your hep B and all this. So, um, yeah, I, 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 unfortunately, I don't think there's that much hands on. And and with dentistry as, as a career, you know, age 17 to, to choose that is... Um, it's a big one. It's, it's, a, it's a huge decision. And if you've not actually you know, seen exactly what you need to do, like we, mm. not just with regards to the actual practical aspect, but the patient management side of things, mm. uh, knowing that, you know, you, you really do need to be sort of really empathetic um, at, and sort of highly skilled at the same time. It's it, it's a big mixture. That, mm. you know, I, I think mm. but, but also if you got, work that out in two weeks work experience, it costs you two weeks. If you go into a five-year process of studying and learning dentistry and then graduating, and a lot of that is based on university without a real patient. So there's the communication skills perhaps aren't as taught to the extent they might need to be. Empathy doesn't exist because you're using phantom heads. All yeah. those mm. things. So you qualify, you then go into a live situation, and this time you're like, oh, bugger, I don't like it. Yeah. But that's, that's a long time to have gone through. <laughs> it's a bit late, isn't it? you sort of got to finish and then even change career. Yeah. 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 Which, um, which dental school did you go to? I went to Sheffield Dental School, yeah, qualified in 2006. Yeah, it was, it was cool. great. Was dental. there a nice balance between clinical and social? Was the right um, mix? Yeah. I don't think Julia was very social. I'd imagine she. <laughs> I, I sort of somehow see you sitting in every night, reading a book, doing your knitting somehow. How can you tell? Um, it was amazing. It was absolutely wonderful. So I lived in sort of the same house the whole way through dental school with um, five of the dentists, and it was very social. Oh, that's cool. There's always somebody around. And actually, with Sheffield, I didn't really need to move out of my sort of mile sort of that I lived in. So I, I lived in this house, went to the dental school, went to the gym, and I worked in a pub the whole time I was there as well. And so I kind of just oh, lived wow. tiny and, and this student union. Um, there was loads of socials with dental <laughs> school got involved with all of those dental sports days were like the highlight of the year that's where actually where i met prem like my, the right. ceo of booty that's um that's where i met him was at one of those um sports days um <laughs> wow, balance, balancing that with the whole academic aspect is is, is is it could it it was a challenge but i think it kind of gets you through doesn't it having that sort of social aspect to look forward to work hard play hard is definitely <laughs> kind of, and did you pass that. first time because we've had a fair few people who've sort of yeah, blown an exam yeah. somewhere at the had, end. Had, had their blips on the way. Yeah, I I, I did pass first time. As it, like uh, the, despite all the kind of the, the social stuff that you see, I'm a massive geek in the background, sort of head girl mentality, <laughs> super conscientious. And so yeah, I hundred percent did did. I think, uh, yeah. throw, I think the throwaway mark of A's at A level was kind of gave us a tip that you're probably quite quite smart. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, no, yeah, I, I worked really hard though. It, it doesn't come naturally, yeah. but yeah, just no, put, no, put no. the hours in in the library, certainly. So then you qualify and you spend 14 years working as an associate on the NHS. The NHS gets gets a lot of bashing. Um, we know that it's a, it's a broken system. It's not fit for purpose. But what was your experience like of, of working in the NHS? What were kind of the high points and the low points? And where did you work? Did yeah. you work in the same practice or did you sort of move around a bit? I worked in a few practices um, around sort of, um, Manchester and Liverpool in the, in the in the fourteen years that I was working with some fantastic principals, and um, the NHS really, like you say, it's not fit for purpose. It's mm. it's it is it's a struggle. It's it's de skilling um, associates so much because you, you really can't provide the treatment that you want to. Um, but by the same point, I met the most amazing patients and I was able to do some fantastic dentistry for, for, for many, many years. And actually, I, I really enjoyed it. And um, apart from the sort of the target hitting, which was sort of the, the negative aspect of it and, and that, that sort of yeah the threat of litigation, all these things that sort of creep, creep in. But overall, you know, I think I think the NHS, it's kind of despite it failing i think it's got some amazing people in it who are actually mm -hmm. making it work as much as possible and, and that's kind of what i experienced i had two two particular principals that i worked with who were just just you know, salt of the earth people really you know yeah feel like they're giving back you know almost mm. and and that's contagious i think and and mm. so the whole practice took on that sort of ethos um yeah yeah i i, I overall i enjoyed it mm. Mm. 
Interesting, interesting you mentioned, because we've, we've heard it a few times and it seems to be sitting there in the back of dentist's mind, that threat of litigation. Yeah. You know, you, you, you've said it, you know, it's like, that it obviously sits there with dentists as a almost like a monkey on your shoulder, for want of a better choice of words, that it's it's always whispering in your ear. I think it's it's terrible, really, <laughs> the fact that you you have to you, you, your mind thinks like that. It's you know that brings its pressure its own, doesn't it? It's mad. It, really, mm. it really does. I think you know, and I don't think it, it depends how you manage it, doesn't it? Some people are able to sort of. Um, and cope with it and, and just deal with the problem. And I used to really stress about it. You know, I used to you know, have sleepless nights that were really you? about certain cases and things. Mm. Oh, 100%. I think, I think, and I think that's the norm. And I think, um, it, and it's Mad. not until really kind of leaving kind of the clinical side of dentistry now and, and checking in with lots of people that I've known from over the years. Um, I didn't realise it was the norm until I'd spoken to like yeah. you know, so many people about it. I thought I was the only one who worried as much as I did. And every, yeah, it is. It mm. is pretty widespread. I think one thing that dentistry isn't particularly good at is, is opening up about things mm. like that. You know, it's getting better. Isn't yeah, it? it's getting better. And now, in, sure. in, in some of the other work that we do, uh, mm. we get to visit hundreds of dental practices as a business a year. And very few dentists, I mean, in, in your work, you would as well, but very few dentists, particularly practice owners, ever get to see other practices and ever get to talk to other dentists in their situation. So we all assume that kind of it's just us. Yeah. You know, nobody else is going through what I'm going through. And when you start chatting to people, we start to realise that there's a lot of people that are going through, <clears throat> through the same thing. You, you, you were saying about you, you no longer do clinical dentistry. And quite often we do put limitations on what we believe we can do and, and you said before that you know i'm a dentist was almost engraved on your <laughs> on your soul that was kind of how you almost defined yourself so can you just talk us through the kind of the process that, that you, you you went through yourself in understanding that you could still be involved in dentistry but you didn't need to necessarily treat patients in a clinical capacity especially you, you obviously enjoyed that? it yeah 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 i did enjoy it but i always felt um well, initially it was kind of, I, I felt that um, I wanted to do something more. I felt that kind of working just in the confines of one room every day, I really struggled with that. I would like drive up to the practice, walk past my little window to my surgery and be like, I'm going to be in there until six o'clock today. Like, and I used to really, really struggle with that um, as well as sort of you know, the, the, um, the, the regular stresses that went along with the job. Um, I felt that I wanted to go out and see the world a little bit more and, and talk to more people. And um, like my, my partner, he was um, he'd left physiotherapy, actually, and had become a, like a manager at a medical device company. And I would come home after a day seeing like 30 patients on the NHS, like really stressed out, you know, worried about stuff, shattered. And I'd go, what have you done today? And he'd be like, oh, you know, took people and did some training and then we went for some lunch. <laughs> And I'd be like, that's not a job. That's not how I was always earning like really, really well. And I just couldn't get my head around the fact that, you know, you could you could work within a profession and um and and but but kind of not having to do the actual clinical side of things. So around 2020, it was COVID time. Everyone, it was mm. almost like a punctuation mark in everyone's lives, wasn't it? And yeah. you know, practices closed and we stopped. And it really gave me that that sort of pause for thought that I thought maybe there is something, you know, I could go and try something else. No one's going to take my BDS away from me. I can always go mm -hmm. back to dentistry. Well, let's just give it a whirl. And so I started looking around um, for, for different opportunities within the profession that I could go into. Um, I felt that, you know, that kind of sales kind of side of things would have been really it kind of definitely interested me. Um, I remember going to BDIA Dental Showcase and just walking around and being like, who can I work with? Where, where is it exciting? <laughs> and it was actually on LinkedIn that I came across dental monitoring, um, right. which in sort, of, sort of incorporated the, the um, AI in the remote monitoring of patients. Mm. And I was like, wow, you know, AI in healthcare um, really is absolutely revolutionizing how mm -hmm. so many professions are doing things. I feel that dentistry is a little bit behind in, in that. And I mm. thought, you know, th this is it. And so, yeah, I saw the opportunity and I took the leap. And lots of people have said to me, oh gosh, that was really, really brave. But I really don't feel that it was. Um, you know, there were certain things that I, once I got into that role, I had to mm. be brave and do, you know, things like 
public speaking and, you know, creating presentations and going into important business meetings, things that mm. you don't do as a dentist that I kind of mm. had, to, I was thrown into. Um, but actually taking the leap, I could, I, I've still got my, I've still registered with the GDC. I could go back there and, and go back and work Mm, yeah. I so wish, but it's it's um, it, it, it definitely kind of it, it felt like the the right time. It, it was the right thing. It was the right decision for me. It wouldn't have been the right decision for lots of people, but it was definitely mm. the right thing for me to mm. do at that time. And in terms of AI, which is kind of at the core of what dental monitoring has to offer its its clients, do, do, you, do you see AI revolutionising dentistry? You probably got a slightly better insight than many being at dental monitoring. A hundred percent, yes. I mean, currently it's focused on the orthodont, like massively focused on the orthodontic patients yeah. and um, where they've come with that, being able to see if, it, you know, a patient needs to move on to the next liner or stay in it for a, f- um, for a few more days, being able to see if your fixed brace, you know, if the if the wires stopped moving your teeth and it's time for you to go back and have that change. That is, you know, mind blowing. But the, the, the potential for it with oral hygiene, with perio, with sort of general sort of dental checkups and things, um, the potential for it, it's absolutely huge. They've literally just touched the tip of the iceberg mm. in the capabilities of what that software can yeah. do. And um, I, I, I honestly wholeheartedly believe that, you know, it will, if, if, if it's embraced by the profession, it will, it will completely change how mm. absolutely mm. is done. We, we spoke to um, Lottie Manihan, um, the therapist and hygienist, ages ago, and she raised something that I'd never really thought about in particular, but she was saying that one of the biggest impacts on the environment that dentistry um, contributes to is patients traveling to and from practices. Exactly. She was saying that all the work you do in a practice mm. is great, but actually the biggest negative impact on the planet is patients having to travel backwards and forwards. So I guess using AI, if it can reduce the frequency with mm. which patients actually have to physically visit the yeah. practice, the sustainability aspect to it, and I'd never really thought about it in that way, but that's a, that's a massive win. It's, it's absolutely huge. Like when you think about it, oh, and I had orthodontic treatment, you were there every six weeks. It's the missing yeah. school. Mm. It's, yeah, it's the getting in the car. It takes hours and hours out of your life to go to those orthodontic mm. appointments over that mm. course of treatment um, to change that. And it's the convenience, you know, we're mm. all busy, busy people. It's, it, you know, we to be able to, you know, if you've got several children and they all, all need braces, this is going to be a huge part of your life. It's, yeah, it's yeah. a part-time job. <laughs> but there's some time, but now they can get it down. So you just literally need like a few appointments but it's not that mm. you're getting checked less it's not negligent you're getting checked weekly if not more yeah. mm. um you know by you know obviously it runs through the ai if anything is picked up that's slightly out of the ordinary that's then mm. highlighted to the clinicians and they mm. can react to that to get you back um so it's almost like it's like a big brother you know it, it's there it's watching yeah. everything that's going on so it's, it's a higher standard of care really um mm. using ai i think some people are quite reluctant they're like oh you know the robots are taking over but I yeah. think what the mindset that we need to take is that we as clinicians, um, we mm. can only do so much as, you know, one person, but we can massively, <laughs> um, massively expand our capabilities by embracing mm. this new technology. Don't give them and, legs. That's mm, what I yeah. say. AI. Just don't give it legs because then it can walk around. <laughs> <laughs> so keep it keep it in a box don't give it legs it just made me think like, can, you, can you imagine like in i don't know let's say 20 years time 30 years time like an amazon drone rocks up to your house and it uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it does a bit of dentistry and it disapp- yeah. just disappears again oh dear <laughs> me just going back to your, hopefully never your, your decision to leave clinical dentistry um some some dentists have but but not that many what, why do you think that is? Because you also went through a process of exploring things that were um, outside of the surgery, but still connected mm. to the profession. But you are you are quite rare. Most dentists qualify and just say in the surgery. What, why do you think that might be? I think I think part of it is that you know you don't say I do dentistry. Dentistry, you say I am a dentist, and so it's almost part of you. <laughs> it's part of who you it's your are. Identity. Right. Yeah. Like, it is. It's your identity. And so I think part of it is that I think some people believe that their um, skills aren't transferable. You spend five years at dental school. That's a huge mm. investment. Some people feel yeah. that that's sort of throwing it away. Um, 
but I, I also think that I think that quite a lot of people do quite enjoy it. It's it's people we've, we've got quite a lot of stuff to moan about, you know. With we, you know that there are sort of certain things that you know within the profession could be better. But I think at the end of the day, it's a very rewarding profession. So I, that's why there is actually a group on Facebook called Alternative Careers for Dentists, and I can't remember, but it's called. <laughs> thousands and thousands of dentists on there um, oh, really? really interesting people and people are making you know the move away from you know clinical dentistry you know becoming teachers or going down the law pathway you know with the indemnity organizations mm. and things like that um and but it's a great community actually on there and um, but i was shocked actually to see the numbers for a little while i, I felt like a little guru on there because like i kept <laughs> replying to people giving people ideas i posted when we've been recruiting i always make sure i post on there as well because uh, it just <laughs> to show people you know that there is you know, if, if you did want to move obviously going into sales that's not for everyone you know mm. public speaking i was at a mm. course today and someone said that the biggest fear in humans um, above death is public speaking and I was I've like, heard really? that as well. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i'd rather yeah. die than get up and talk in front of people like yeah. I, that, that's that's kind of I, I i don't get that so yeah this kind of movie it it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be for everyone into this but mm. There definitely are so many different avenues. And I think that it's underestimated those skills that you have to have. And there's so many skills um, mm. as a dentist that you have to have. You can use them um, in, in lots mm. of other ways. And I think it's just kind of having ideas and, and yeah, being brave enough. You know, mm. at the end of the day, we've all got to earn money. We've all got mortgages to pay and things like that. And taking a step away from that, which is quite often a pay cut away from dentistry, mm. um, that, that's a risk that some people just aren't willing to take. Mm. This week's episode is brought to you in partnership with Ultimate Dental Business. We know as guys who have supported dentists for over 25 years and through hosting this podcast that building business skills in dentistry is vital. Time and again, we hear from dentists who tell us that they find the business side of dentistry the most challenging. And we know that stress and pressure comes from doing things we don't feel well equipped to do. That is why we are delighted to be part of Ultimate Dental Business, the new dental business hub delivering top tier business training for dentists. Founded by Dr. Brad Thornton and Dr. Krubel Shah, Ultimate Dental Business is a response to the lack of robust dental business education currently available. Through our effective collective discussions with dentists, it was clear they most needed good structure and effective guidance to give them the knowledge and tools to be successful dental business owners and to create a business that serves them rather than the business takes all their time and energy to keep going. To find out more about developing your own business education, click on the link in the show notes or go to ultimatedentalbusiness.com. I think you're also right. I think we very quickly and easily overlook what transferable skills we do have. Definitely, yeah. We don't put them into another context and say, well, what what could I do? Um, And actually, in, in your situation, having that, clinical knowledge that real empathy of what it's like to sit next to patient after patient mm. and taking that into the the trade in the industry is, is is a superpower because there aren't many people that have that dual aspect adding the drama confident background is uh yeah <laughs> it's interesting yeah, yeah people do when i'm kind of I obviously I've only worked with products that I've felt really passionate about and mm. you know because I, I, f- I think that when you are selling something you, you do have to feel like that yeah. but when I do uh, mention yeah. to people that I'm a dentist they do listen uh, like differently I don't know because like, like they kind of see that I totally understand I've walked a day in their shoes it gives um, you authority yeah. almost yeah yeah um which is is great it's it kind of it quickly gets you into that sort of trusted business advisor rather mm. than just kind of trying to a salesperson yeah just yeah. Sales. yeah yeah definitely yeah. so then you obviously first met prem at a sports day when at uni and then yeah. a call came from prem um what sport were you doing at the time was it like um, hurdles or javelin tequila shots to know um, oh yeah interesting sport yeah, yeah. No, 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 get a well-known no, no, sport well-known yeah. olympic sport yeah olympic yeah. sport we're, we're very we're very good um, at that we normally get in the medals tequila shotting yeah i think because i'm tall it was like you can be on the netball team and then that was the <laughs> <laughs> so oh, now we've got to go goal attack goal defense yeah. or the bunch that stay in the middle don't know what yeah called. yeah so i think i was like i was i was in inverted commas playing netball slash socializing prem had some sort of um, like crazy fancy dress costume on. I think, I don't know, it might be Homer Simpson. There's no surprise there then, is it? That's so out of character for Prem. Yeah. 
And um, and and we've been so we, yeah, we've been quite good friends for like twenty odd years. And then the call came out of the blue. I was, I was at Dental Monitoring at the time, and he was like, you know, do you fancy coming to be our, our global sales manager? And there was there was a, a huge attraction there because I, I'd seen how they market, and it's just mm. it is out of the ordinary. You know, it's an extraordinary <laughs> product, but it's 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 they have a lot yes. of fun, a lot of fun. And I mean, most was, people will know who he is, so. but but Prem's the founder of Boutique Writing. And if ever you've been to a a dental exhibition. And if you see anything outrageous like a giraffe or, um, or a dinosaur or a dwarf, or dwarves, that will most likely be a boutique yeah. stand because he he is extraordinary from the marketing side of things. I'm fascinated to know what the interview process with Prem is. <laughs> I don't think there probably was that much of a formal interview <laughs> process, to be honest. Um, he approached me with the role and we spoke and I spoke about my vision of, of like how how I saw it kind of playing out and really um it's because we're taking the leap into those global markets now it was mm. to be at the helm of that and mm. having had my experience from dental monitoring working within you know like a big corporate organization going to this much smaller one that, that's something like you know I, I, I kind of wanted to bring my experience from that there mm -hmm. um and so yeah for, formal interview process was we, Probably there probably wasn't really one, um, apart from just yeah, be, being able to bring my my vision and it be aligning with his really. Mm. And I think, I, I think but the thing great. is, Prem strikes as somebody who has great intuition. Um, culture will be very strong yes. for him, and we 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 sacked off the formal interview process decades ago yeah. on the basis that you're much better off having a coffee with somebody and chatting them about them, what their weekend was like. Yeah. Have they been on holiday recently? Exactly. The you truth. Know, what did they yes. do at the weekend? When you just get people to relax, you truly find out what they're at. And Drop their guard. <laughs> yeah, but, but also, uh, you know, over the years, everybody's been through a formal interview process, so you know how to answer those questions. Yes. Whereas if you just sit and chat, you really get to the kind of the bones of, of what that person's like. Yeah, so I'm like a big fan of conversations yeah. as opposed to interviews. The personality and character ethic, you know, the... Um, Stephen Covey Seven Habits yeah. of Highly I've mm, always Highly Effective that, People you, Yeah You can You can You know You can present your personality Like what's above the surface Of the iceberg Of sort of mm. You can present that However you want But it's actually The true character You mm. need to get down To like you know Who that person actually is And you can't do that In an interview You, you fundamentally can't Culture is Is a huge you know, We've just recruited a team And it's been it's, it's a huge focus On what we do And why everybody Is so loyal Within the business You know And you know Why we all do Sort of work so hard and give that extra hmm. sort of, you know extra bit of effort in everything that we do is because we know that you know it's it's almost like a family where we are hmm. and we know that you know prem's really got our back and one thing that he says all the time is it's nice to be important but it's important to be nice hmm. so it's kind of um, one of those things is so like yeah, we fill people with kindness in everything that we do within the company and sort of you know and, and externally to all the kind hmm. of things that we, and people that we meet um that the the culture of the company really has been uh, how i i feel how how you know as well as lots of other kind of clever things that have been done it's been sort of the basis of the success mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think nice is massively underrated isn't it yeah. you can do yeah. and achieve so much by being i think somehow nice is mistaken for soft mm. and woolly whereas actually it's not yeah <laughs> I think mean, nice and caring, I, I've said it before, but I remember Ed Sheeran, the musician, was interviewed and they were asking him like, why he's so successful. And he said, you need skill, you need to work hard and you need to be likeable, nice. Yeah. Mm. But he said, I've given them to you in the reverse order. First of all, you have to be likeable and nice. If you're not the sort it's of true, people want you never to get work past with, it, it, nothing ever gets going. If you're yeah. a bit of a dick, nobody wants to work with yeah, you. Nobody yeah. wants to spend time with you. Whereas if you're nice, that will create opportunities. And then you need to work hard and you need to have some skill. And I, I think there's a there's a lot of truth in mm, that. Definitely. I think yeah. that likability factor. And I think if you can then ingrain that in your culture and you have skillful people. You know, we were at the, the dentistry show and, and Stephen Bartlett was talking and he talked about the importance when he's hiring of people that get the culture of the business and do they have like exceptional skills to move the business forward. Mm. So if you've got those two things, it really matters. And then it almost kind of takes on its own being. And uh, yeah. it sounds very much like within boutique, you've got a, a, a core of people that absolutely get this culture. So when new people come in, they just take on 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 that way of working. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. And pe- people do buy from people, you know, that's, you know, it, it sometimes, you know, there's some very average products, but they've got a great salespeople, you know, and then yeah. ship forms and then, and then that's where the loyalty to that, to that brand is. So it's kind of, yeah, that's something. And I find it's contagious as well. Mm. So once you have got that culture there equally with, with bad culture that can be contagious, but good culture. Mm. Once, once everybody is kind of is on the same page, um, you know, you'll, you'll find that that grows within the team. And then, mm. then that's surprising. You, you see it kind of in action at things like shows, you know, where, yeah. you know, the, the team have gone about things and, and taken, you know, their own initiative to do something for someone. And it's been, you know, it, it's formed a great relationship somewhere. And you're like, yes, we're, you know, really cool. we're winning. Really, <laughs> really cool. So you're global sales manager at Boutique. Um, Boutique is very well known in the UK. I don't know what percentage of dental practice you're in, but it's, it's, it's significant. Yeah. 60% of dental yeah. practice, which is, is an amazing oh, number. Julie did. There's good, just as well. Global sales manager, well a, done. Amazing number. <laughs> um, where, where, does, where does Boutique sit on the global stage? Is it is it known outside of the UK? Is that kind of your job? Yeah, that, well, that is my that is my role, yeah. So mm. it's... Um, and is it, are, they, are they brand new markets for you or are you building on what things that have already been done overseas? So um, it's been established in Australia for a little while. So we have um, Stephen Douglas, who is managing that over um, in Australia. And it's actually really, really growing. Um, completely different. It absolutely fascinates me how you need to sort of approach different markets in completely different ways. So, um, I mean, we do a lot with education over here. There's huge gaps, you know, where which we fill with, you know, with regards to sort of um, how to sell whitening, how to do whitening. It's not really taught at dental school. But in Australia, yeah. that's really been how he's been able to grow the brand massively is, you know, is, is hugely focusing on, on the education side of things. Yeah. We have recently launched in Kenya. Well, that's actually last year, Kenya and um, Italy. Uh, we're quite established in the Netherlands as well through a distributor. So we've been, mainly been working through it with distributors um, sort of across Europe. Um, and so that, that that's my responsibility, sort of like train the, the, sure. um, the sales reps and the people on the road who are going out sort of selling the product. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, um, it, it is really established. Next, next on the map is the States. Uh, right. Really excited. We're looking to kind of get set up over there. Um, whether that be awesome. through a distributor or direct direct sales, we're just we're looking for a, yeah we will be looking for a sales manager quite soon, and um, yeah I mean obviously not everything translates across the pond, but we're no. pretty um, I think we're really pretty lucky in this country like to have sort of like smaller up and coming like sort of new brands because mm. in other countries it's it is just like the big players you know the big sort of yeah. global names that are dominating the market. To take them on, you know, requires you to be quite brave, and it is mm. a risk. Um, I'm, I'm confident we can do it. I'm confident yeah. we can. <laughs> and it's that well. thing about the point of difference. It's interesting what you say about in Australia that their their market is very much taking down the route of of education. Um, but from a business point of view, you know, dentology is about the business of dentistry. Um, is whitening something that is fully appreciated as a practice as a profit builder in practices in the UK? Do people see it as a as an income line that does add profit in that way? Um, so no, I think it's massively underestimated. Mm. And you know, when when we do training with people, we we often talk about how it is the most profitable thing that you can be doing with your chair time. You know, it, it takes about forty five minutes um, from start to finish to whiten a patient's teeth. By the time you've done a consultation, you know, and fit the whitening trays and reviewed the patient. And, you know, it's it's around a rate of around sort of £400 per hour, but it's definitely not a difficult 45 minutes mm. for dentistry. You know, it's, it's really quite straightforward. If you're using a good protocol, you'll get reliable results. And um, it's a pretty huge margin there. And it's kind of like a gateway treatment. So patients will have it done and then they'll think, oh, well, I might go and get them straightened now or I might go and do this. So mm. it's a huge practice builder. Um, but also patients love it because it's relatively accessible as a treatment because it's not as high a cost as other cosmetic treatments. Mm. Yeah, and you do get these sort of really great, you know, sort of life changing results with it. So it's a rare situation in dentistry where you get that sort of that that win win, you know, happy, mm. really happy mm. dentists, um, you know, very profitable treatments, but delighted patients. And I mm. think that's sort of um, but I think what people underestimate with it. So they go, right, well, I'm going to do more white. I'm really going to try. It can't be passive sale in your practice you know patients mm. don't 
come in, like very few patients will come in and be like, whiten my teeth. Um, there's mm. certain ones that will, they've got the money in their hand, they're, they're ready to go away. But it's the active engaging in that conversation yeah. that is absolutely crucial in sort of taking that patient forward and, and talking them through it. Because patients quite often will come in and they just want to have their checkup and, and leg it, you know, their petrol. Mm, yeah. Um, and then, um, and then some people would just be like, oh, it's a bit vain. You know, I'm a 50 year old bloke. Like, I don't really want to mm. kind of go around thinking people thinking I'm like, you know, spending money on my aesthetics and things. Um, and so there's so many reasons that people don't bring it up. And so what is like, you know, and part of the training we do is, is how to not be awkward in starting that conversation. You can't turn around to a patient mm. and go, you know, have you thought about whining? Because that's just that's just offensive. So mm. well, you know, it's kind of it's it's having ways and means of getting the whole team in, involved in starting that conversation um, and being able mm. to like sort of drive those patients towards it's an interesting one is it? i really hadn't really thought about that in the fact that you can't really say do you want whitening why is there something wrong with my teeth exactly. it's like had you introduced botox yeah you could do with some botox why <laughs> am i a bit wrinkly oh, oops it's really hard yeah. to know if it's yeah right. i hadn't really thought about that it's quite an interesting yeah. one yeah okay. yeah but we we like you know what what we do with our with our training is we we, we talk patients well, we talk teams through how to start this conversation with patients yeah. But ultimately, it's having the it's having the confidence, the whole team having the confidence in talking. So, how would you start the conversation of interest? So, um, what we would normally do is we would recommend that um, first of all, as part of the consultation, you take a look at the patient's teeth with them. So, whether that be you take a picture of them and you've got a fancy TV screen in your surgery and you blow it up really big on the, on the TV screen, or sometimes it's just with a handheld mirror and you just look at the patient's teeth and you just say to them how do you feel about the shape shade and position of your teeth and when sat with a dental professional looking that image at that image of their own teeth patients just write their own dental shopping list themselves and they'll just wow. go you know i wish they're a little bit whiter and then at that stage what you do is you, you get your shade guide out and we recommend that people set up their shade guides going from light to dark on the little shade guide tabs because right. They set it up in the way that they come when you buy them. It just looks like a jumble of colour. But when you've set it up in a particular order, going from light to dark, you can show patients. We'll go. We'll see where you are on the light to dark scale. And patients then um, are always really intrigued into where they fall on this yeah. sort of scale. Show we them love where comparison, they are. don't yeah. we? Yeah. 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 Comparing things. Show them that it's um, that you know ninety five percent of patients will reach B one shade, the lightest shade on the shade guide, following this really good protocol. And then show them the end of the shade guide that you naturally go to with age, which is the darker end. And then, yeah, most patients at this stage will go, oh, well, you know, it's it's not even that expensive. I'll just go yeah. ahead. And then the patients wow. that don't, cool, it? Oh. it will plant a seed in their mind and they will but say, it's their you know, decision, it's their yeah, choice. Yeah, it's it's their choice. They came up with it, you know, when you asked them about how they felt about their teeth, you know, they didn't have to say mm. that they, they wanted to have them whiter. Mm. It, that, that whole process within a consultation takes a couple of minutes and it's not it's not an aggressive say you just kind of leave mm. it there but when we do this training with like corporate groups and with um like just i did my friend is a dentist she works at a booth practice up the road and i did it in her practice and she was like we were doing one to two cases a month ish and she was like since i've started doing this in my consultations i'm doing minimum three to four a week and she was like wow. that's an extra holiday for me a year that's, and she that's was like, an earner that's amazing that. isn't it? pushing it on them the patients appreciate it because these are all mm. patients that wanted to have their teeth whitened but i just wasn't bringing it up with them when they were in so mm. it's just it's, it's almost like the patients are appreciating it as well mm. and, and you know she's it, it's, and it's great. repeat business isn't yeah. it that's the great yeah. thing about yeah. it and then they're coming back and having them straightened now and you know mm. restorations replaced and things like that because when you whiten your teeth if you've got a crown at the front that's like a dark yellow shade matching your already darker teeth then that's going to stand out like a sore thumb so you'll need to replace that as well so it kind of it does lead to other treatments within the practice mm. as well and it can be a huge practice builder mm. Mm. i think that tactic of getting the <clears throat> the patient to kind of be involved in mm. the treatment planning decide to themselves yeah. that's what they want mm. um that yeah that that that, that kind of is it, it, it's an education process mm. Yeah, it, much like Samir, yeah, the wasn't sale, it? The sale comes yeah, out of, of like, yeah, 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 yeah. The education, um, which I brilliant, really I, good. I, I love that. Um, how important is fun in what you do? <laughs> uh, uh, we, we, we're going to come on to the neon party that we, we enjoyed <laughs> recently, but but how important and and for you, but also for the organisation, because there's it, it's fun with purpose. It's not just for fun's sake, mm. but it's fun one of those kind of kind of cornerstones in terms of the culture within is there a fun officer yeah 
Yeah, Prem. That's, that's his job. <laughs> he comes up with a okay, yeah. idea. Official title, yeah. And I, I have to I have to make them happen. Um yeah, fun is so <laughs> important. And mm. I think within dentistry, dentistry is very seldom fun, actually. Yeah, you know, it's quite mm. a serious profession. Um and I think that's what we're what we want to bring as 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 a brand and just as people as individuals is um it is you know to show people that you know we can do things differently it mm. can be a laugh um and i think it's almost that escapism from the day to day day grind of things um also really selfishly we like having fun so you know whenever mm. we organize mm. something we like to do that and i suppose also you know there's a, there's a bit of that fomo you know if you if you can see that a particular brand is always you know having such a laugh and there's lots of other people that you know faces that you recognize getting involved having fun there other people will then want to join the party mm. yeah <clears throat> well we got to take part in some of that fun um we just on the back of the the dentistry show and you did a a neon party and they're becoming quite legendary these these neon parties aren't they they, they are yes yes it is um and you were yeah. responsible for arranging this one as well weren't you because i think prem kind of sent it I your was. way yeah, yeah. The, the the brief was that people just had to come away and be like, "Wow, like that that has blown my mind." Like, what are they on those guys? And um, I think I think we achieved it. I think we did. Um, it's yeah, it's it's very Instagrammable. Obviously, neon. It's something that everyone can get involved in, and it's it's it, it, like yeah, we like to push the boundaries of like what we can get away with as well. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's uplifting for other people as well because I think you know within you know, the trade, the profession, you do look around what other people are doing. Yeah, I think yeah. when somebody is... inspirational. Yeah, when, when somebody's kind of pushing the limitations of what they do, it does make you think about kind of, yeah, are, are we doing enough It's stuff? a bit like you're, uh, not that I can really, uh, my kids would tell you that, that they always felt that the oldest one had the hardest time because she was the one who pushed the boundaries and everyone else followed. Yeah. And it's yeah. a bit like the same thing, isn't it? Oh, well, they, they got away with bare-bottomed waiters. <laughs> <laughs> Now that's there we go. It's another sound bite that. <laughs> did, did, did we get away with that? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's but fine. It's, but it's, it's fine. a bit like the limiting beliefs. Going back to kind of you saying, um, "I am a dentist." You know, the limiting belief could have kept you in the surgery, whereas yeah. exploring the possibilities beyond that. And I think within business, sometimes we do the safe things. I mean, he gets he, he's overquoted, but Richard Branson's a great example of somebody who will try different things and mm. ends up kind of abseiling down a skyscraper and getting exactly. the back of his trousers ripped off and you know nearly losing his life <laughs> in a hot air ballooning trip i'm not saying we should all be doing those things but it does it does make yeah. you kind of pause for a moment to say right okay so are we just kind of treading a well-trodden path would it be more interesting and would there be be more fun to try something you know yeah. to try something a bit different to be in the top one percent you need to be willing to do what the other 99 percent yeah aren't exactly willing to do. um so it is it's it, it's taking it away from the norm you know walking around the dentistry show you've met some great people some amazing companies mm. um, but sometimes it can feel very clinical very corporate mm. uh, yeah, very yeah, safe, yeah. Dull. You know? <laughs> yeah. and um yeah we, we definitely want to Put, push the boundaries of um you know bring bring it bringing fun to the present to the profession um and um but but also it's grabbing people's attention as well you yes. know it's, it's it, it, you know everyone's talking about about, about yeah, what we're yeah. doing and, and that's great it's great press yes <laughs> yeah. yes it is very good yeah. we've got it was to, very uh, enjoyable as well it was it was good fun it was good fun late night not as late as other people no but, but um, no, most, most good nights not as late as julie i believe <laughs> 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 we, we've 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 got to the time in the in the show, Judy, where we need to ask you two questions because no guest sets to leave without answering these two questions. And our okay. first question is: If you could be a fly on the wall in a situation, where would you be, and who would be there? I would like to have been a little fly that buzzed into Apollo Eleven and um and got into the rocket and went to the moon and actually looked out the little window and saw neil armstrong go on the on the kind of the surface of the moon for the first time firstly because in 1969 i can't get my head around that they actually did that then like no. just like the biggest sort of like success in engineering ever um, but also because I almost can't believe it happened, like 1969. Like, not that I'm like a moon landing denier or anything. Conspiracy theorist. Yeah. 
Yeah, but what's that film with Elliot Gould? Is it Capricorn One? Where they yeah, create where this this whole stage situation yeah. where it didn't yeah, actually yeah. happen. I, I I almost can't believe it. I drive up and down the M62 and I can't get phone signal to talk to my colleagues. But in 1969, <laughs> clear as day, we heard, heard Neil Armstrong say one small step for man. Like, did that really happen? Um, but, but yeah, I also just think to look out from space down at the earth, um, I just think that is just must be mm. absolutely unreal. So that, that's All my the point. astronauts who say they've done it, they've said it's a very humbling experience, yes. haven't yeah, they, when they've yeah. looked at the but budget, budget, Budget aside, Judy, if you if you got... The opportunity to go on Virgin Galactic, which takes you out to the outer limits of space. Would you do that? I would absolutely do that. Would, yeah. Yeah. I'd absolutely, I'd bring my little boy with me as well. He would be like, <laughs> oh, sure. I would absolutely blow his mind. He's absolutely obsessed with space and we talk about space travel all the time. But um, yeah, I definitely would. Providing it was safe, I would definitely yeah. do that. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what? I think Julie is the only guest, I might be corrected here, who has actually described the fly and where it's going. Yeah. Everyone else gives an answer. You were yeah. the small fly that yeah. buzzed into yeah, you the... You actually became the fly. Yeah, it was like, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. I was just thinking, of all the episodes we've done, nobody has actually described the fly and where it's going. So there you go. <laughs> and our follow-up question is, you can meet somebody. You can sit down with them. Um, they can be dead. Well, obviously not when you're meeting them. But yeah, uh, yeah. Whoever you, whoever you want. Who would you like to the opportunity to sit down and meet? Oh, um, so I think it would probably be my um, my maternal grandfather, who was um, sort of a performer around the clubs, not nightclubs, oh. like the social clubs around Liverpool. Could play by ear, and he was quite famous. He was it was in World War Two, um, in a prisoner of war camp in Cyprus, and oh, he wow. actually. Oh, wow. Paternal grandfather over there, so they were friends before my mum and dad met. That was just so it's, it's a weird story. Wow, that is bizarre. But isn't it? He had this huge performing um, sort of reputation. People still talk about the jokes that he used to tell and the songs that he used to sing. Wow. And I can't help but feel that those genes have like you know come down. Yeah, they must have transferred, mustn't they? Yeah, yeah, these little extroverts that are running around now um, are all as a result of those genes. And so I'd love to sit down, listen to his jokes. He was an amazing performer and singer. Listen to him singing some songs wow. and actually get to experience this really sort of well-known guy um, that actually unfortunately i never got a chance to meet so yeah it would be oh. him yeah wow, brilliant. <laughs> are your are your kids um performers they're still quite young but they're still they're know? only seven and five um yeah. but yeah they play up yeah <laughs> Yeah, there's definitely, they have these Alexas in their room now and they have like, they do put musicals on there constantly and they're, cut, and it takes me back to when I was a kid, sort of my, my older daughter is, is it, my, my daughter is bossing around her little brother, put, and choreographing him into doing these, these songs and dances. And I'm like, that's exactly um, how, <laughs> how I started. So yeah, um, it's uh, great fun. Lovely. Thank you for your time today, Julie. Yeah, it's been, brilliant. It's, been it's great really fun. good. Thank you. It's been you. great fun. Uh, oh, great stories. I think the way your career has, has weaved and bobbed around, I think, is, is interesting for you, but I think it's also inspiring for other people in dentistry to show that there, there is a world beyond the surgery. If that's in the second act, to explore. see, leading on the yes, exactly. uh, theatrical yes. there. So I think we need to draw the curtains on this. Hey, see what you do. Take a bow. <laughs> on this performance, we will let we will let the listeners go for a break, and they can go to the toilet and get themselves a drink during the interval. And before we ice. come back with another episode. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Oh, I love this. Yeah, entertainment, whatever. <laughs> Lovely. Brilliant. Thanks, a lot, Julie. Look Thanks, Julie. Julie. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Dentology, where we discuss the business of dentistry. If you like what you heard, please do subscribe where you found this episode. That would be amazing. And also follow us on Instagram.